Hello, I'm Joel Blackford with Beth Hesed Sabbath Fellowship in St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm asking you for chapter 7 here of Revelation, what time it is on God's clock. And I'd like you to continue on this journey with me through all 22 chapters. We're going to be discussing chapter 7 this time, sealing the 144,000, John's vision of heaven. And what's going on up there? Who are these 144,000? We need to ask all of these questions and get answers to them. Why are these 12 tribes listed and why in that order? Why, why, why almost every time God lists, lists the tribes, they're different. Why, why, why? Why are we waiting for the seven trumpet blasts now? Why doesn't he just get started? Why, why does he have this time of silence? If the godly were raptured already, who are these 144,000? Hmm. And what do the white robes, and why wouldn't the 144,000 be raptured beforehand, say, if the, the godly were raptured out? We need to ask those types of questions. White robes, what does that mean? May we still repent? Is there free will? Have we taken the mark of the beast yet? No. I'll just warn you on that one. Don't take the mark of the beast. Just don't. Does 7 contradict chapter 14, or does it enhance it, or does 14 help? And I'll show you some of those slides. Will the earth be silent, too, in addition to heaven being silent? Hmm. Will the lamb feed us during this time? So here's the lamb. I keep him close to me, you can tell. And will he feed us during this time if we're hungry? And why wipe the tears right now? We'll answer those questions. But first, I always jump in and do the Olivet Discourse. So let's jump in and look at the question that they asked Yeshua. Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that you are coming? And that the Olam Hase, the everyday world, is ending. When's the marriage supper? And he answers things. This is a paraphrase of Matthew 24. You'll be arrested, punished, put to death, hated, uh, all sorts of horrible things. You'll increasingly distance yourselves from the Word of God. And uh, then there's this phrase that I want you to be aware of called uh, the witness to all the goyim, possibly meloha goyim, the fullness of the Gentiles. When that comes to the end, when all the Word is proclaimed across the world, then it's time to go into the time of birth pangs and Yeshua returns. Dave Williams has this comment about the end times. He says, I think we have all of these things occurring. The problem is he uses the imminent return. Okay, That means that he believes in a doctrine called imminence. I don't believe in that doctrine. So he's citing all of these things, but he doesn't believe these things are occurring because that means that, that Yeshua can return at any point in time, but they're the birth pangs. You'll just see that as you discuss things with me and go back to the Bible and read it. You're going to see these are all birth pangs. These are the seals. That's what they are. But let's just look through a few of his things. Um, the focus would be on the Middle East. Yes, it is. Anti-Semitism is increasing, especially in Europe and America now, too. Uh, we just had that shooting a little while ago in Pittsburgh. Um, horrible, horrible times that we live in. Chaos. Oh, there's chaos in divided nations. Epidemics, pandemics, technology is advancing, terrorism. Um, uh, sexual emphasis, which is weird. Um, and then resistance to God's messages. And, and revivals will happen, but are they God's revivals or not? Jesus answers it in Matthew 24 about what the birth pangs are, but this is a different uh, analysis of it from Joel chapter 2, and Peter describes it in Acts chapter 2. After this, I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions, and also on my male and female slaves in those days. I will pour out my spirit and will show wonders in the uh, heaven above, and I will show pardon me, uh, in the sky and earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke, and the sun will be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood. These are signs and birth pangs before the coming of the great and terrible day of Adonai. So what you should see is certain things occurring. You've seen the blood moon tetrads from 2014 and 2015, but you'll see more than that as we move forward. These are birth pangs. As I've described before, if we want to open up the seal, and we don't, or the, the, the document, the scroll, so to speak, and the seals are not completely off, so of all the seven seals, if they're not off, then we will just tear this, and Yeshua doesn't tear documents. So just keep that in mind that the Lamb is perfect, and he will open up all the seals before we go in. We will not see the seventh seal opened until 8-1. If there are seven seals, how could the scroll be opened before all seven are removed? You would tear it. So when I show you pictures of other people's ideas of how the tri Great Tribulation goes, you're going to say, well, that doesn't work. He's going to tear the document. He's going to tear his scroll. So all seven have to be removed. Removed. Uh, you can't begin until he opens all seven seals. He's opened six, and we're in the chapter waiting, but he will. we must wait patiently until the eighth chapter. We're in a narrative break. 
pregnant pauses, I call them, pregnant. We're, we're literally out to here, waiting for this to happen. God uses these uh, narrative breaks as social, religious, legal, kingdom etiquette uh, references, and, and he uses them very specifically in the Torah. So Revelation reads just like Moses. Keep that in mind. John and Moses are like blood brothers, and they really are in many ways. Um, actually, John is, uh, well, no, I don't know John's specific family, but he might be Levitical. You never know. The main thing is uh, certain thoughts are going to rhyme here. 7 and 14 rhyme. Get used to it. There are some chiastic structures going on, not necessarily as much here. But the main thing is uh, Yeshua uses parables, and some of these things are pictorial, some of them are parabolic. And so just keep it in mind, um, uh, there, these narrative breaks, breaks don't necessarily make sense in the natural, but sometimes you can figure things out and at least get a comprehensive pattern, a chronological pattern. Um, there's a veil. This is a green screen, just so you're aware of it. Most eschatologists believe the seven seals occurred during the final seven years based on a flawed doctrine called imminence. It doesn't work that way. Your mother knew she was pregnant. We all believe the seven seals resemble, or we believe, I believe, and many of us do believe the seals rem resemble birth pangs. And many are coming over to this way of thinking right now as they're reading the Bible. That you may observe and verify these things. They're, they're cosmological. They'll make sense logically. Some of the signs coming up when we get up to chapter 9, it's not going to be logical anymore. But up until that time, I could explain things scientifically all the way through chapter 8. With the conclusion of seven, seven, uh, chapter 7 and seal number 7, you will see a continuation to the seven trumpets. It, it's linear. Keep that in mind, and I'll show you the pattern in just a little bit here. The seventh day, that seventh day helps us to see that pattern too. Otherwise, we'll have a veil. If we don't keep the Sabbath, you aren't going to see that pattern as well. This is one man's characterization of the end times, the pre-wrath rapture timeline. So he says that, you know, before any of the wrath occurs and the Antichrist shows up, you're raptured out. It doesn't seem to make sense, um, but at least he gives you a time frame and kind of gives you that the seven weeks begins here, the 70th week rather, and the midpoint. And he's, he's fairly accurate on certain things, but he's got the trumpets right next door to the bowls, you know, in the last half. And then the sixth seal kind of, there's, I don't know. It's just, it doesn't make sense because you can't really get into those trumpets and bowls until the seventh seal is open. This is another man's characterization of it. This is where he spreads out the seventh seal, which is a silent seal, and then he explodes the trumpets in that, and then the bowls are on top of each other. It's kind of illogical, but it is staggered, which is interesting. Uh, I don't think you'll see bunching like this. This is another man's description, which is right on top of each other. So you don't know if you're getting a seal or a bowl or a trumpet or whatever. It's all just, it's just a mess. Now, I'm intrigued because he said the, the rapture is at the end. So he's got some aspects right. I mean, there's some truth in everybody's thought process. Um, I'm saying that you will see as of 1967 through 2030, the seals open and magnify. The first three and a half years are the trumpets. The last three and a half years are the seven bowls, about every six months. And then your job is to pray and find your Goshen or your Lot's cave, someplace to protect you because God's bringing his wrath against the wicked. Do you have a veil? I don't know. The seven seals have to open first. This is my timeline with narrative breaks, so keep it in mind. You'll see the birth pangs are the seals. I believe, based on the, the seal one, is, is basically anti-life against the West from 1967. That happens to be the day that Moshe Dayan handed back the Temple Mount, and, and you'll see changes in 67, 68. It, it, sex, drugs, and rock and roll seem to be Western civilization after that point in time. And now our births are supposed to be 2.11 births per family to keep populations going. We're about down to 1.3 and 1.2, and no civilization has ever come back from that chaos, uh, chaotic of, of a birth pattern. So seal three opened in 2012. Seal one, I'm rather, seal two was east. George Bush opened that up in 2001 to 2003. Wars aren't ending east of Jerusalem. 2012, you'll notice that judgment is starting to occur at that point in time. Um, 2018, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I don't know when seal four, five, six, seven will open, but you'll see 1.8 billion people die in seal number four. So just keep that in mind. And then the trumpets would open up after that and then the bowls after that. I don't do chiastic structure. Don't ask me to do chiastic structure other than chapter one and chapter 22. The rest of it doesn't really match up. And if you really look at this chart, 
uh, in terms of chiastic structure. So if your pastor says, it's poems and it's chiastic structure in Revelation, you know, just, just listen to me a little bit more and less to that person. Let's get ready to go in. Shh, silence. This is going to be quiet. The four angels will hold back the four winds. It will be very silent. So I want to describe silence to you. And shh, I'm talking silent. Silence is the prayers. John's seeing the silence, offering up, sanctifying, sealing the first fruits, all of heaven quietly pausing for either Ma'ariv, which is the going into the Sabbath, or Habdallah, which comes out of Sabbath, and I would say that would be more like it because that would be the first day of the week and th then there would be seven days coming up. So you would say Shavuot Tov. I don't know if you're going to say Shavuot Tov on this last week of years, um, but just keep that in mind. It, I think it's Habdallah. That's why I underlined it. You can tell. You, I'm rather biased. You can see a confirmation bias. I, I think it's Habdallah prayers. Then Yeshua removes the seventh seal in 8-1 and opens the scroll to begin the seven, final seven years, beginning with the seven trumpets. And so this time of praying, and, and this, is a, this is a time when you notice this occurring, you should be quiet and you should be praying. Find your prayer closet. When God is quiet, you know, this is a verse from the Psalms. How long, Adonai, will you forget me forever? Can the dust praise you? God is silent sometimes. Don't worry. He's very active. During the silent times, he's very, very active. The Lamb is very active. And so... The first two verses, silence in heaven. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind could blow. I'm linking that to cosmic rays, could be extreme, or the lack of cosmic rays, which technically are, uh, provide health risks. On the, on the land, on the sea, or any tree, I saw another angel coming up from the east with a seal of, from the living God, and he shouted to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea, shh. This is very quiet right now. Now, we're going to go back and be noisy. We're going to go back and reference the, the differences between seal 7, silence, and seal 6, which is noisy. Very A great earthquake is noisy. And I watched in the sixth seal in the great earthquake, and the sun turned black. That's a noisy experience because people would be screaming if the sun turned black and sackcloth. That's what it would be like. It would be very dark. And, and then this full moon, this is interesting. Now, you're saying, Joel, you didn't describe that to us last time. You didn't really say much about the full moon, which is the middle part of the month. Why? I got a new Greek New Testament. And it, it did have Olo in there, so I found the word. And so I hadn't cited this before because my other Greek New Testament was different for some odd reason and didn't have all the passages that I wanted. Uh, the moon would be blood red. That is the only time that it can be blood red and be a full moon. So that's why um, the full is important there in the Greek. The stars fell from heaven. That would be noisy in its own little way because you'll be screaming as, as they fall like a fig tree drops. It's late winter. So that's January. Um, the good figs come during the late summer. The bad figs are there in January. They're bitter figs and they will drop during January, say during a full moon in January. That's another time date stamp as shaken by a strong wind. So this is noisy again, and seven is, chapter seven is quiet. It's shh. And then the sky receded, like the electromagnetosphere is, is receding. As I've described before, it thinned 10% from 1880 to 2000, and then another 5% until 2010, and now it's receding about, I, I wanna say it's 10 times faster than they anticipate, and they don't know why. It's not global warming, people. It seems to be related to God is rolling back the sky like a scroll and every mountain and island will be moved at some point in time which sounds like pole flip. What you should see is this in, in seal number six, corona hole, uh, mass ejections or more solar wind and more activity, more noise. You won't see that in seal seven, it's quiet. You will see earthquakes and volcanoes and you'll see lightning strikes and things like that. You won't see that as we're in silence. Keep in mind again that cosmic rays, or lack thereof, are very unhealthy. Um, you will have problems with your heart, and you will have problems with your mind. So, uh, and autoimmune issues too. So, zero is unhealthy. One, two, three, four, five, six are pretty healthy. But when you get up to six, seven, eight, nine, it gets extremely unhealthy. So keep in mind, some cosmic rays are good. Too many are not good. None are horrific for us. So silence is bad. Now let's deal with the Lord of the harvest. That's Yeshua. Uh, he is the Lord of the harvest. The angels are the harvesters. They're the Ketzers. Uh, they go out and do his bidding. 
So just so we can prove this through so you can see it because you're going to say, well, Yeshua does everything. No, 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 no. He has the angels do it. Then he says to his angels or Talmudim, the harvest is rich, but the workers are few. Pray that the Lord of the harvest, the Lord of the harvest, that's Yeshua, will send out workers to gather in his harvest that the laws still apply there. He, he would send them out just like in the olden days with Moses, Abraham for that matter, made souls. So it, you would send out your workers as the Torah still applies to John. It sounds just like Yeshua and John sounds the same way too. So I'm arguing constantly that whatever was a good law, you may call it legalism, but it's still a good law. Don't do what you're not supposed to do, touching a hot stove. It's not legalism. Okay, so just, just be aware of that. I'm going to argue that all the way through, that, that you're not supposed to marry your mother, and that started out right away in Genesis, and it continues through Revelation. You, there are certain things that you just know are wicked and wrong. Stop doing them. Now we continue on to the next phase that we need to discuss, another backstory. What's a teruma, and, and why are they sealed, and when is the harvest? So the teruma is the first fruits. It's not listed in chapter 7 as the first fruits, but it is in chapter 14. So let's just compare and contrast. Let's, let's talk about this narrative break between the sixth and the seventh seals when God needs to remind humanity of the offering of the first fruits, the 50th, the first 50th of the total har harvest, so one 50th. Once the first fruits are received by God and sealed, the seven trumpets may begin during the first 1260 days or 42 months or three and a half years of the tribulation. The assumption is that the total harvest will be brought exactly related to the first fruits. So one 50th, what would that be? Well, 144,000 is like 7.2 million, and we'll prove that through. And uh, that Yeshua is the Lord of the harvest, another rule again, but you have to be aware of that, and the angels are doing the harvesting. So let's compare 7 to 14 so you can see it. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who have been ransomed from the world. These are the ones who have not defiled themselves with women. That's idolatry, just so you know. They, they don't have to be virgins, I assume, but they can't be idolatrous. For they are virgins, they follow the Lamb wherever he goes, and they will be ransomed from among humanity as first fruits, Bikarim, we would call them, or Teruma, for God and the Lamb. On their lips was found no lies, and they were without defect just like the lamb. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we have sealed. So uh, sealing is like observing his Sabbath, for this is a sign between me and you. I'm citing Exodus 31. The, the, these signs are like seals, so keep them in mind. Um, the servants of God on their foreheads, I have, so this is Revelation 3 and 4, I have heard how many were sealed, 144,000 from every tribe of the people of Israel. 144,000. I'm arguing that this is just like Moses taught, the Teruma, the first fruits offering. And, and so they will be set apart. And Ezekiel talks about it too. Tell the people of Israel, you are to observe my Sabbaths, the day of the sun? No, not Sunday. It would be Sabbaths. This is a sign between me and you and through all your generations so that you will know that I am Adonai who sets you apart from me. And the 144,000 are set apart. That's Ezekiel, or that's Exodus rather, and that's Moses. But it sounds just like Ezekiel. I am Adonai your God. Live by my laws. Observe my rulings. Obey them. Keep my Sabbaths. The day of the sun again? No, it's Sabbath. Keep it holy. And there will be a sign, an oat, between me and you, that you will know that I am Adonai your God. So it's the consistent thought heading through into Revelation. Either Moses says it or Ezekiel says it. These are signs. You are set apart. Sun Sunday is not a set apart day. Sabbath is. And you will need to be aware of that as things get more dicey. I heard how many were sealed. Let's head in and look at the tribes now. Keeping in mind, this is not the birth order. This is not necessarily the military marching order. This is a different order, so let's discuss it. Judah is first. They are normally listed first in terms of marching, but they're the fourth in birth order. You can see 4B would be before birth. And then Ezekiel, the last time it's listed, they are seventh there, which is interesting. 12,000 of him, then 12,000 from Reuben and Gad and Asher and Naphtali. This is an interesting order. Um, we're missing Dan. Dan is darkness. Dan is... The first one to go into idolatry, Dan is not listed, but Levi is listed. Levi has no land benefit, so this must be something spiritual, something important, because, um, and he kind of doubles up a little bit, so um, Benjamin is listed there, but there are a few things missing. So let's discuss these tribes and what's going on. We'll do a little bit of gematria. I don't tend to do much of it, but I want to show you first, this is how the tribes are laid out for a military march, okay? Issachar, Judah, and Zebulon. So, Zeb, uh, so Judah would be first, and those tribes would be with them. 
And then um, after that comes the um, southern tribes, and Benjamin and Ephraim would lead that, and Manashe, and then we go to Gad and Reuben, and Reuben would lead it, and Simeon, and then Asher and Dan and Naphtali. Not a birth order, but happens to be a military marching order, and then the Levites and, and all the Cohens are in the midst of them. Let's look at it this way. This is interesting. This is 888. I want you to be aware of this because it's gematria, and I don't tend to do that with you because you're going to say, I don't study gematria. But you have to be aware that if we look in the Hebrew for these particular tribes, they add up to 8880. Just interesting. Then the names. Some of you may be aware of Missler, and I want to cite that Missler came up with Genesis 5, uh, the names, how the names have a meaning. And it was, the meaning was man, Adam, is appointed, Seth, and then it goes on down the line until you get to Noah, which is comfort. So man is appointed, mortal sorrow, the blessed God shall come down, his death shall bring despairing comfort, Noah. And so in this case, this man is saying, hmm, there might be a meaning here. So it's a Basically, the sons should mean this. Judah means praise. Uh, Reuben means affliction or love or fortunate um, is Gad. Happy is Asher. That, that works, yep. Yeah. Naphtali is mighty wrestlings and my sister prevailed. Um, forget all my trouble is Manashe. So let's just read the whole thing together and see if it means anything to you. Praise, affliction, love, fortunate, happy, mighty wrestlings, my sister prevailed. Forget all my trouble, heard, unloved, attached, wages, good gift, dwell with me, take away my reproach, another, son of my sorrows, son of my right hand. Is there a meaning in that? I don't know. Think about it. This is Monty Judas' take, and so just like I like Missler, because Missler did very good studies. I don't agree with everything that he says, but I'm starting to like Monty Judah a lot. And so this is his take on 144,000. We'll discuss more in the next half of this. But let's, let's look at Judah's take first here, Monty Judas. So Moshe said to the people, equip men from among yourselves to go for war. They're to go and fight Midian. So this is that Numbers 31 battle. And, and Monty Judas pulling it together. So let's see what we can do with his. We'll call it a Midrash. That's his opinion on this. In order to carry out God's vengeance against Midian, you are to send out to war a thousand men from every tribe. So it's like 12,000. So it's interesting. This is Numbers 31, early in, in 31 there. You're supposed to send out 12,000. So it's a type and a shadow of the 144,000. It, it matches. So 12,000 total go out to war. And then we read later on, the officers in charge of the thousands who fought, the commanders of the thousands and the commanders of the hundreds approached Moses and said to him, your servants have counted all the soldiers under your command and not one of us is missing. Whoa, that is a comparison to the 144,000 because they will be mighty warriors. They will go into idolatrous Midian and uh, they, will, they will win. And so you'll look forward to these 144,000 being mighty and protecting us in some interesting ways so that each one of them has obtained some gold and some, so these men brought back booty, so to speak. This is from Numbers again. So now let's look at this from Monte Judah's perspective. And I like this. So we're jumping way forward to Revelation 21. So well, let's compare these 144,000, see if they're listed in 21. And this is the new Jerusalem. So great high wall, 12 gates. 12, on those gates, 12 angels. And the names written thereof, and the names of the 12 tribes. Oh, that matches. Of the children of Israel, the gates, three gates, and, and, and three gates, and south three gates, and the west three gates. And so there's 12 foundations, and the names of the 12 apostles are listed, okay, of the Lamb. And then he talks with me with a golden reed to measure the city. That's interesting, too. That's part of Revelation. Measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city is four square, length as large as the breadth. And they measure the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. Hmm. Seem a lot of 12s and a lot of things like that, and the length and the breadth are equal. It's cubish. And he measured the wall thereof 144,000. I'm adding the thousand in their cubits, okay? According to the measure of a man, that's 19 and a quarter inches. So it's big, it's huge. The main thing is that seems to be a reference to these 144,000 being Jerusalem's walls, and they will be like precious stones in Jerusalem's walls. This is once again Monty Judas saying this, not Joel Blackford, but it's rather interesting. And the building of the wall will be of jasper and a city of pure gold and clear glass. And the foundations of the wall will be garnished with precious stones. These might be the 144,000 or a representation of them. 
jasper and sapphire and chalcedony and emerald and sardonyx and sardis and chrysolite and beryl and topaz and chrysophorus. I don't know how to say that. It doesn't matter. Yacinth and amethyst. The main thing is they, what they do will be so important that they will be remembered in the foundation of the New Jerusalem in chapter 21. Just be aware of that. It's very interesting. So you, this is a 144,000 reference that Monte Judah is making again from Isaiah 40. But just look at this. And this is started that comfort section of uh, Isaiah. You, the 144,000, he put that in that, that reference, who bring good news to Zion. Get yourself up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, cry out at the top of your voice. Don't be afraid to shout out loud. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Here comes Adonai Elohim with power, and his arm will, be, will, will rule for him. Look, his reward is with him, and his recompense is before him. He is like a shepherd, feeding his flock, gathering his lambs with his arm, carrying them against his chest, <laughs> gently leading the mother's sheep. So what he's arguing is that they will be mighty. They will be powerful. They will be doing much, much, much. So keep in mind, the 144,000, according to Monty Judah, will be amazing. So we are ready to end our first half of this. Stick with me for chapter, or part B, but chapter 7, and we'll be ready to go in just a moment. Thank you for your time.